Hi, this is John Kofer for our video blog, Sign of the Times. Today we're going into a very special topic, dealing with our 2015 General Conference session. The title is, Ted Wilson, Yes. Revival Information, No. Dan Jackson, Yes. Revival Information, No. A curious title, but soon you'll see why. When we looked at our General Conference session, which is almost over now, today's Friday, we saw a very, very interesting battle. Some think this battle came to a climax or a conclusion. Nails were being bitten. People were watching actively online. Thousands were watching, whether it be Hope Channel, 3ABN, many other platforms were live streaming and tweeting every moment, every aspect of the general conversation. The main issue being talked within and without sessions was the women's ordination vote. We're not going to deal with all the different aspects that showed something that was not completely what it appeared to be at the general conversation. We won't focus on the fact that the language concerning the spirit of prophecy has been changed again, further watering down and muddying our clear message on the spirit of prophecy. Of course, the spirit of prophecy is one of the present true topics of Adventists. That's not our topic. Our topic is surrounding these two leaders and what they represent going into this general conversation and what we really saw at the general conversation. Some believe that, and some have said, that revived information has triumphed and that the showing of a no vote for women's ordination shows that the church is on the right track and that we need no self-supporting work per se. Uh, we all need to get under and with the movement and help the church bring revival and reformation. Again, our topic deals with Ted Wilson, yes, because he was voted back in as General Conference President. But revival and reformation? No. Ted Wilson, when he first came in, talked about a great controversy project in which he would get the great controversy before the nation, before the world, as stated in the Prophecy of Ellen White that it was a necessary book and must get into all the world. It should be our priority. Now, we well know that that was quickly substituted for the book or the abridged book, The Great Hope. The Great Hope is the official sharing version of The Great Controversy, even though it basically gutted, removed all the mention of not only the papacy, its atrocities, and the various messages and statements, biblical and prophetic, that outline its nature, its work, and its last day persecution of God's people. Every vestige has been wiped out. All the reformers, all the atrocities, all the, the, the identifying marks of Antichrist. On the website for this book, Great Hope, it even tackled the subject of who is the Antichrist. And again, this further muddied the clear message that the three angels' message gives on who is this Antichrist power or this beast power of the apocalypse. Now, brothers and sisters, could Ted Wilson truly be a bringer of revival information and the greatest of books that we have among us to promote this truth of present truth, revival information, be taken and brought to the great hope? What about many other issues and points where there could have been a tremendous move for revival information? Now, some would say in his defense that he spoke against T.D. Jakes, and I say amen. Some would say he talked about not having preachers and teachers from other denominations come in and preach among us. But brothers and sisters, even though he said that, that very same week there was an ecumenical dialogue or a interfaith dialogue at the General Conference. That very same week, and even continue to this day, there are many First Day ministers, priests um, of all denominations, pastors and so on, preaching at our universities. It continues to this day. At our general conference session, one of the greatest issues that showed that revival information was not truly coming and was not going to be dealt with was the women's ordination issue. The women's ordination issue, even though it is many times looked at as a North American division issue, it was brought to a forefront by the Columbia Union and the Pacific Union. Because the union or the union in our conference organization has the ability to ordain pastors. Just recently after the no vote came in, the North American Division issued a statement saying that they would cooperate with the General Conference and they would continue to commission women to do work and so on. And it seemed as if they, to some, were backing off the idea of going forward with women's ordination because the General Conference voted. They did not have the authority to vote. But brothers and sisters, the issue was that the unions were taking these votes. The union were taking their right to ordain pastors 
and giving this right to women. The issue was largely a policy issue. As you go back and look at some of the history, these issues were looked at and voted upon by union leaders and they showed an overwhelming majority in favor of women's ordination. Now to those that think that the women's ordination vote and the fact that large numbers, they say, some say, voted against women's ordination, was it actually large numbers? Actually, the vote was 41.3% in favor. Now that may not seem significant to you, but when you look at the Twitter page of the head archivist at the General Conference Archives, he tweeted a very interesting factoid. He showed the three General Conference votes, 1990, 1995, and 2015, and the percentage of yes votes in each respective year. When you look at those facts, it starts to show a trend that would quickly, I believe, silence some of the views or thoughts being promoted that this was a win for women's ordination and that God is still leading and guiding his church. Brothers and sisters, are we seeing God leading and guide his church or creeping compromise? What do I mean by that? When we look at the Twitter page of the lead archivist for the General Conference, he showed that in 1990, the yes vote was 24%. In 1995, the next General Conference, the yes vote was 31.2%. In 2015, the yes vote was 41.3%. Brothers and sisters, we're getting very close, yea, we are on the verge of 50%. Didn't Jesus say in Matthew 25 that when 50% are wise and 50% are foolish, that cry came? At 50%, the cry came, go ye out to meet. At 50%, they were all to be brought in. Brothers and sisters, how prophetic is this creeping compromise toward more and more favor toward women's ordination? And how long before the world church and the delegates of the world church are either split down the middle or largely in favor of women's ordination. What we saw was a world church delegate vote. The vote in North America, I think, would be much, much higher. And most of the present truth or conservative ministers that are saying amen and hallelujah to these things live in North America. But when we talk about Dan Jackson being reelected, what does that say about God steadying the ship? and bringing in Revival Information. Again, Ted Wilson, yes. Revival Information, no. Dan Jackson, yes. Revival Information, no. In other words, when we look at Dan Jackson, Dan Jackson also believes that he is at the head and is a part of a movement of Revival Information. Both the so-called conservative and the so-called liberal or progressive sides of the House with their represent representative leaders both believe they are part of Revival Information. One believes that their Revival Information is new and innovative worship styles, new and innovative forms of evangelism, endorsing women's ordination to pastor Seventh-day Adventist churches, and even to bring in a more tolerant, loving, quote-unquote, environment, even for the LGBT community, community as members in our churches. Now you say, well, that's never been voted. That can, can never be. But it's just a, the idea of having almost 40% of the world delegates vote in favor of women's ordination in a short amount of time could also at one time be said as never to be. We also understand, brothers and sisters, when we look at this trend, that Elder Mark Finley made almost a prophetic statement at General Conference, sorry, GYC session just last year. He said that their concern is that they would see a vote in favor of women's ordination and then further votes or further sentiments concerning conscience, concerning tithe and issues of sexuality. Now, the vote going no toward women's ordination, does the sentiment change toward tithe issues? If we look back at the Treasury report during the NAD, uh, uh, for the NAD during the general conference session, the tithe report or the treasurer's report showed that the NAD is giving significantly less to the world field. Brothers and sisters, we can see that to continue. It's signs of the times. 
Who has the majority of money in this world field? Who gives the majority of money to the world field? It's not the North American division. If the North American division gives the majority of the money, who has leverage? Who can, because of this vote, say, you know, even though we did not get the vote that we wanted, we can't conscientiously support, with the tithe and offering of our division, funds to go to an uh, institution or to a uh, group of leaders that are systematically discriminating against women. How can we retain our 501c3 if we systematically discriminate against homosexuals? How can we continue to have our connection with ADRA and other different types of government organizations and receive money for our university and so on if we systematically discriminate against women and gays and all these various different social issues that are so prominent among us and being embraced largely by the very progressive new organization leadership of the North American division. Brothers and sisters, here we are, and here's the sign of the times. Was there a win for revival information during the general conference session? Was there a win for revival information for the NED during the general conference session? I close with this thought. In 1990 and 1995, with no internet, no social media, no Twitter, no large discussion and dialogue all across divisions concerning women's ordination, the amount of support jumped from 24% to high 30s or mid 30s, just with, well, low 30s, because it went from 24 to 31%, but that jump took place with no internet, no Twitter, no mobilization. This women's ordination issue became a center point because of the votes taken by conferences, sorry, by unions here in North America. With Twitter, with the internet, with various unions sending out letters, with various churches and so on, talking about, various people preaching about women's ordination, there was a greater emphasis and idea toward women's ordination that has ever been seen. We saw another major jump, 10 points from 1995 to 2015. Do you believe the NAD and its statement to continue is going to now back off? Do you believe the tremendous outline they had for the North American Division and their future plans? So eloquently stated by a good friend of mine, Pastor Marquise Johns. Do you think that that North American Division statement is going to be retracted now and the women's pastors that they talked about getting are going to be pulled back and all the things will be reshaped and more in line with general conference votes. For instance, they're already moving forward. They've gotten the greatest advertisement they ever could have gotten during this session. They've been able to mobilize and even have this no vote cause a greater fervor. A yes vote would have been triumphal, but a no vote further creates resolve and desire to forward the movement and to take their own personal liberty, they believe, to do what they believe is right. And the sad part is, brothers and sisters, many of the conservatives that believe that this is wrong and so on, that live in North America and are subject to North American division policy, are about to find out how bitter a cup they actually poured out for themselves. Because again, remember all these individuals that were speaking against North American uh, division policy and North American division actions and union actions in fostering women's ordination. These speakers like Doug Bashler, Stephen Bohr, uh, um, Brother Wahlberg, all these individuals that made public statements, do you believe that the ASI rules, which are nothing more than North American division rules, may be changed and tightened to keep control of certain speakers and certain statements that are critical of leadership? not supporting duly appointed leadership? Do you think there may be some tightening of rules of where people can go and preach? David Gates was a very, very glaring example of the, I would call the first fruits of what's about to take place as those that were against women's ordination here in the North American division start to feel the sword come against them. Brothers and sisters, we're going to see some interesting things happen when the ASI and Outpour Centers National umbrella which people believe is self-supporting, which is nothing more than a, a basically an agent of the conference. When these entities are made more and more stringent, when the rules and screws are tightened down on these institutions, and you have to either sign documents like David Gates was asked to do, 
Sign away your liberty, sign away your conscience, sign away your ability to preach against women's ordinations. And that. When these things start to happen, when you can't preach present truth as you usually believe that you could, when you couldn't preach about health anymore because you're not a doctor or a conference approved health speaker, when these things start to happen, how many are going to start to find things that were sign the times, even on these blog posts, that they thought one time were ridiculous? Truly a point of clarity. I'm J.R. Kofer, and that's Sign of the Times.